Welcome to our training on why protecting student data is so important. My name is Amelia Vance, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. Today, we're going to be diving into potential risks to student privacy and why student information needs to be protected, including some of the relevant legal frameworks, but also beyond that, ethical and obligations to the children that uh, each educator is serving. So before we dive into this, let's talk a little bit about why there are special protections, both ethically and legally, for children. So among other things, there brains are not fully developed. So you have situations where they're unable to fully weigh the benefits and risks of data collection and use, what they may post online, what they may share with their peers or with others, what they may say in chat or in person. Similarly, they have limited impulse control and may react in a way that they regret later or that someone older might not act. They may be socially vulnerable. This is related to the fact that they also have a lack of experience and really uh, want their peers to like them, want to identify with those around them. They don't necessarily know social norms. They may be more trusting. Uh, and at the end of the day, you see potentially more acute harms uh, when it comes to children and data and technology. This is partially because of all the reasons I just listed, but also because children have difficulty understanding potential future harms and any harms, especially with data that is shared, may not be fully realized or discovered until later when a student may be applying for college or a job and maybe a picture online or something they said back in the day pops up and they lose out on an opportunity. So with that framework in mind of why these special protections uh, exist all over the world, let's talk a little bit about the law. You heard a quick summary of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, in one of the earlier videos, but we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about it now. So this is the simple version. This is the slide to print out and put up uh, on uh, next to your desk. So uh, this is based on a great resource from the data quality campaign. And it shows FERPA rules of the road. So when it comes to red lights, uh, no one can sell student personal information that's protected by FERPA or use it to market to kids and families. This also applies to students over the age of 18. But this is only about data that's protected by FERPA. Other information that uh, may be gotten from other sources could be used, but information that flows through schools generally, not allowed to sell it, not allowed to use it to market. Student personal information that's protected by FERPA can also not be reshared without consent. There's a minor exception, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, for our yellow light, anyone, including the teacher, needs to have a legitimate educational need for student data before they can access it. And they can only use data for the original purpose for which the data was shared. That person and their use of the data must be under the direct control of the school. And they must maintain strict data use and security requirements, such as using data only for the purposes for which it was disclosed and destroying the data when it is no longer needed for a specific use. And then our green light, parents of K-12 students and students who are in a post-secondary institution or over 18 usually have an absolute right to access their child's education record, their own record. The student's teacher 
as mentioned, can access information when they have that legitimate educational need, when they need to access information to meet a student's educational needs. Now, all of these very high level principles have a lot of caveats associated with them. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like now. There are two big main goals of FERPA. FERPA passed in the 1970s, which is when many privacy laws in the US first passed. And it was an atmosphere of concern about data use. It was an atmosphere of mistrust for government in the wake of Watergate and concern about equity. There were multiple articles in newspapers around the country about how students were being denied access to their record but not being allowed to graduate because of something that was allegedly in that record, uh, being denied opportunities. A survey actually found that schools were more likely to share information with law enforcement than with parents. And so Congress acted and passed the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act in 1974. And it is two main goals. They wanted to make sure that students and their parents access their own educational record or their child's education record. And they wanted to assure privacy. They wanted to prevent unauthorized disclosures of education records. And unless an exception applies. And if either of those rights were violated or believed to be violated, a complaint could be filed with the U.S. Department of Education. I highly recommend, if you want more information on FERPA, checking out studentprivacy.ed.gov, where the Department of Education has magnificent resources and videos. We'll go a little more into FERPA, but not too much more since at the end of the day, a lot of what you need to know is more around best practices and ethics than specific legal requirements. So let's talk about that right to access. Parents have the right to inspect and review their child's education records, and they can challenge the contents of that record or ask that information be changed or deleted. Schools must respond to requests for inspection within a reasonable time, but no later than 45 days. This is generally not going to be something that you as the teacher are going to be required to do, but you may be depending on the size of the school. Uh, FERPA prohibits the school from deleting or destroying records while access is pending. So sort of going back to that want of equity to make sure that information that uh, put the school in a bad light that was discriminatory couldn't be removed from the record before the parent or student could see it. And schools can't charge a reasonable, an unreasonable amount of money in order to provide that access. Even if the copying fees uh, are very high, they still have to make sure that it is reasonable enough that parents can access it. So what about that right of privacy? Parents' written consent is required before disclosure to third parties unless an exception applies. So let's remember back at that stoplight, you as a teacher or any third parties like ed tech companies, like researchers, like community organizations, tutoring organization volunteers, all of them can only get data with written consent unless an exception applies. And there are exceptions because if you had to get consent each and every time a volunteer came in, every time a new teacher was brought in, every time, you know, you signed a new contract, um, it would be impossible to run schools. And so there are many exceptions in FERPA, some that are very specific. And if those exceptions apply, Third party recipients, whether you, the teacher, an ed tech company, or others, must agree not to redisclose that information. And they generally have additional responsibilities and requirements under FERPA, depending on which exception is used to provide the information. There's one small exception to all of this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And schools must keep a record of all third parties not including teachers, be reassured, um, 
of all third party requests and disclosures so that parents can see what third parties are accessing information about their child. Again, there are a lot of caveats, a lot of legal nuances here, but keeping it fairly high level. So what are some of the most common exceptions to consent? Uh, there's a couple of videos that I've linked here specifically on directory information and the school official exception. Those are gonna be the two exceptions that you as an educator will need to know the most about. So directory information is that exception to the exception I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Directory information is what allows you to call a student by their name. It's what allows you to have yearbooks or playbills or announcements of, you know, names and weight class or whatever else at sports games. Um, directory information in FERPA is considered generally harmless information to release even though it does include some sensitive information that would be, for example, in a PTA directory, like address and phone number. Once directory information goes out the door, and schools don't have to give it, they can choose to give it, um, anyone can access it because the nature of, you know, the playbill you get at the play or the handout, the flyer you get at the sporting event, you can't collect all of those back. They're already out there. Uh, and so directory information actually allows parents to opt out. So if parents do not want their child's information shared under the directory exception, they can choose to opt out. And there's an annual notice that's required to tell them about that opportunity to opt out once a year makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, as I said, things like yearbooks, et cetera, uh, you would have to then go and get individual consent, um, but it is an important right that parents have since information can be shared more broadly under this exception than the others. All of the other exceptions have limitations to the sharing. So once a company, a third party, a public health official gets information, they are not supposed to share that information with anyone. So these other exceptions, the school official exception is how ed tech companies is mentioned. Uh, teachers, others often receive information under FERPA. We're going to be talking more about the school official exception in our ed tech training. And so I will hold on saying anything more about that but you can click uh, in the resource, in the downloaded slides, in the list of resources, and in the comments if you're watching this video. The health and safety exception is for emergencies. If there is a pandemic, for example, if there is a serious and imminent threat to the safety of a particular student, um, this exception allows schools to share information in order to deal with that threat. So this might be anything from finding out where students are after a hurricane or where they were supposed to be and sharing information, you know, with public health authorities or others uh, in the case of the pandemic. Um, it also includes, as mentioned, if, you know, there is a threat on someone's life, if there's uh, something that's judged credible or uh, something that's going to happen, is imminently going to happen and they need to warn people, they can go ahead and use this exception. This is probably something you may have heard about with all of the school safety work as well as with the pandemic recently. And there's a lot of great guidance from the Department of Ed and others on how to use this exception. But most of the time, administrators, not educators, are the ones who will be making the call on whether this exception applies. Studies and audit and the evaluation exceptions. Don't worry about these unless you're sharing information for education research, whether for your own education, getting a master's uh, or other degree, or if you're sharing information with other third-party researchers. If you are, check in with district administration and learn more about this exception. And then law enforcement can access data 
generally via subpoena. Uh, there's a couple other potential ways, but the key here is if a police officer comes up to you, FERPA does not allow you to just turn over that information. There is a process that has to be followed, uh, even sometimes with a school resource officer. And so you should ask your administration about what to do if your SRO or other, uh, other police or law enforcement um, come and ask you questions about a particular student uh, or want information about, say, you know, who might be in a class at a particular time. Generally speaking, you're not allowed to disclose this information and an administrator will have to make that call. So that is all we're going to talk about FERPA um, until we get to our ed tech training a little bit later. Um, I want to talk now really briefly about state laws. There's a bunch of them. Just in the past six years, we've had 41 states pass 132 laws since 2013, and all 50 states have introduced a student privacy law since 2013. There has been a robust uh, legislative activity on student privacy. Most of the time, these laws are not necessarily going to apply directly to you, and when they do, they often mirror what FERPA already requires. So things like making sure that the school has direct control over information, uh, prohibiting anyone getting information from using that information for other purposes uh, or non-educational purposes, making sure parents have the right to review and correct their child's record, making sure data is secure and confidential, making sure that parents are notified of unauthorized disclosures like data breaches, uh, clarifying that student records will not be retained or available to the third party once the contract is over, describing how to comply with FERPA, prohibiting third parties to target advertising to students. All of this should sound pretty familiar because all of these are already things that FERPA says, but not quite as clearly. You had a lot of state laws that mirrored FERPA, though there are some that went above and beyond. For example, some states like Colorado require that parents be notified of any apps being used in the classroom, which would absolutely affect your day-to-day -day work and what you'd be required to disclose uh, to the parents of students in your classroom. So make sure you ask about what, what laws may apply to you from your administrators or check out our website where we track these laws at studentprivacycompass.org slash state dash laws. So let's move past all the legal stuff because at the end of the day, most of what I just said is not going to sink in. It's not something that you'll necessarily remember. It's a lot of legal gobbledygook. And you can certainly look back at these slides, but most of the time you're going to follow the law just by following best practices, by being ethical and careful and thinking strategically about the risks that your students may face when it comes to student privacy. So what are some common privacy concerns that you can think about as you're adopting ed tech or other things in your classroom that may raise privacy risks? So people worry about the permanent record. They worry about that stereotypical file that never goes away in the principal's office that when you're 40 years old, you call and, you know, they'll get down your dusty record and find out about your miscreant youth. And I... Uh, Parents worry that mistakes that their children make uh, will follow them for the rest of their life. They worry that, um, particularly when records are digitized, that that information will now be online and more accessible to others. And so that's a really big concern that is often reflected in laws and that often comes up uh, when parents express concerns to all of you. Commercialization, uh, there's often concern about ads popping up, about kids possibly being targeted 
uh, through advertising on the internet uh, and uh, having inappropriate profiles created of them to sell them certain things or to categorize them uh, for those who may want to sell them something. You also have concern about age inappropriate content. Uh, so are children accessing something that they shouldn't? Are they uh, able to get access to something that is not particularly appropriate for their age or for whatever work they're doing in the classroom? Safety. Both physical and emotional safety come up frequently as major concerns. Parents obviously worry about stranger danger and the physical safety of their children, the possibility that their children share information or have data online that would allow someone to find out where they live and uh, maybe where they go. But they also worry about social and emotional harm. So are they accessing potentially age inappropriate or just plain inappropriate sites uh, such as those uh, around eating disorders, um, sites that are filled with misinformation, uh, sites that make kids feel bad about themselves. All of that is something that is often top of mind when privacy comes up, even though it's not quite squarely a privacy issue. And related to that, social harm. So is there information that gets shared about kids that has others making fun of them that they feel bad about, that you know makes their teachers or other adults or peers in their life judge them or see them differently? And do they suffer some negative feeling because of that. There are also concerns about over-surveillance. So whether it's security cameras in schools that recently there have been conversations about facial recognition, whether it's palm scanners through the lunch line, whether it's uh, remote proctoring of exams uh, done via webcam, there's a lot of cameras, there's a lot of monitoring of student that goes on, what they do on the internet, what they do, um, you know, when they're home, when they're not home. And so there's a lot of concern about exactly how that affects children and whether they are less likely to do well learning since they feel like maybe they can't fail, maybe they can't uh, think outside the box and say things that they're thinking if they're being watched all the time by some ominous big brother. And so you have a lot of research there and a lot of concerns that are raised. And then there are equity concerns. This is incredibly important. You have everything from the digital divide where certain students don't have devices and have to depend on school devices those school devices may be more monitored uh, and uh, may send alerts when students, you know, type particular words or visit particular websites in an effort to help with safety, help with age-appropriate content. But that means that kids that don't own their own devices are going to get in trouble for something that maybe the kids that do have their own devices, uh, most likely kids of a higher socioeconomic status, um, those kids aren't going to get punished for their curiosity, whereas those who are using a school computer may. And so there are a lot of equity concerns as to the effect that surveillance, that um, the collection of data and use of technology may have on different populations. And then loss of opportunity. There's fear that all of the above concerns, the permanent record and social harm, over surveillance, equity, all of that could lead to a missed opportunity, whether in school, you know, qualifying for, you know, AP courses or not, uh, getting a job, getting into college, getting an internship. 
that the data that's collected and its seeming permanence could lead to fewer opportunities in the future and that you may not even know about those missed opportunities that come from something that happened when you were younger in school. And so these are sort of the broad concerns. Think a little about how these resonate with you. What sounds familiar? What are the concerns you have? What are the concerns you've heard from parents? So why should you care about student privacy? The theme of this particular training section. So federal and state laws, as mentioned, you could get in trouble whether, you know, a federal or state law uh, is violated. Uh, you may not have a particular fine filed, but oftentimes when, you know, there's a FERPA complaint, when there's a privacy issue, it's individual staff who may get blamed. And so there are many uh, personnel policies, HR policies that have been adjusted to say that teachers have additional responsibilities when it comes to privacy. Unfortunately, that often doesn't come with the training necessary to actually prevent getting into trouble in the first place. And then finally, not only is protection of student privacy legally required, it's the right thing to do. Parents and students deserve data security and privacy. Everyday parents entrust their students' education, safety, and well-being to educators. They also are entrusting their students' data. So now we're moving to the activity. Mr. Richards takes his science class on a field trip to a local museum. The students are really excited, and Mr. Richards starts taking pictures of the students by exhibits for the school website. Mr. Richards also posts one of the photos to his Facebook account. Of the risks I just raised, which of them come up by Mr. Richards posting pictures on his social media account? What risks are raised by just posting them on the school website? As part of this activity, we have our scenario on the side here, and we'd like you to sketch down which of the risks that we went through are implicated and why. You can pause the video now to do this activity. A final reflection before we end. Write a few sentences about why student data privacy is important to you. Share your thoughts with a colleague. As I asked earlier, which of the risks discussed are you most worried about for your students? What about for your child if you are a parent? Thank you for joining this training.